Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, August 11th, 2014, and here are our top stories. Tonight, looters use a police shooting to justify their rioting. Then, how it's always humanitarian when the U.S. does it. And the Alex Jones Back to School special. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Actually, we've gotten Common Core stuff that's become national news a few months ago where it said the Constitution isn't for everybody, it's group rights. So I know they're going in that direction. Well, after a fatal shooting this weekend in Missouri, there have been riots and some calling for the National Guard. Paul Joseph Watson reports on Infowars.com. Rumors that the National Guard had been called to deal with rioting in Ferguson, Missouri, proved to be false. But many were clamoring for a more serious response as crowds looted stores and engaged in standoffs with police after the fatal shooting of an unarmed teenager on Saturday night. Now, as the mayor said, we're only hurting ourselves, only hurting our community and hurting our neighbors. And that's exactly the point. There's a lot of questions about this shooting, but how does it help anything but reinforce this kind of shoot first mentality from the police, from the government, when they respond by looting in the neighborhood? Now, there's a couple of different versions about what happened. Now, Fox News in the area reported, first of all, from some eyewitnesses that they were essentially just a couple of teenagers who were walking down the street. The teens were identified by witnesses as Michael Brown, 18, and a friend, Doran Johnson, said they were just walking down the street when a Ferguson officer drove up and ordered them to the sidewalk. Johnson said they told him they were just a minute away from their destination and they would soon be out of the street. Then there was a verbal confrontation. So you don't talk back to these guys. You just do whatever the overseer of the plantation tells you. At that point, Fox News reports, from Crenshaw, an eyewitness that said that the officer got out of the car and fired a shot. Now, both teens ran. She said another shot was fired. One of them hid behind a car. Anyway, the guy who was shot was running with his back to the officer with his hands up. Clearly a case of murder by any rules of engagement. You don't get to shoot someone when they're not a threat to you, not a threat to the public, when you're wearing a blue uniform. That doesn't make it legal. Now, the videotape that would explain all this, of course, that was taken by Crenshaw, who talked to Fox News, was confiscated by the police. The police are now saying that it's going to take weeks to see if this teenager was intoxicated or on drugs. It's going to be a very long investigation. They say it shouldn't take that long. We should have a speedy trial. We should see justice done. I don't know that that's going to happen, but the police are saying that it was essentially a shoplifting, that when he went to arrest this guy, start to put him in the car, there was a, a hassle, a tussle, and a shot was fired, and the guy ran, and then he was shot. Even under that narrative, I don't, it doesn't look to me like it's justified. We should be able to see the information. We should be able to see the videotape. Of course, they're going to keep that. It's one of the reasons why, as we look at the anniversary of the 40th resignation of Nixon this last weekend, we see that public trust in the government is down to a record low. Now this uh, article from Outside the Beltway that came out this weekend said that now there's only 13% of Americans say that they can trust the government to do what is right always or most of the time. Now the interesting thing is, is that the sea change in all of this happened around Watergate. Prior to that, through the 60s and 70s, the majority of the people always said that government could always be trusted to do the right thing always or most of the time. That's a pretty naive idea. And so really, in a sense, Nixon gave us, did us a favor by breaking that. It was something that we always knew, of course. Patrick Henry said, trust no man, but bind him down with the Constitution. When you have people in power who don't believe that they're governed by the law, like our president, like our Congress, that's when the people should be suspicious of that. We should not give that kind of trust to government without watching what they're doing. And of course, it was interesting to see as we looked at the resignation of Richard Nixon, the person he resigned to was Henry Kissinger, not his vice president who was going to become president, not to the third uh, and successor to the presidency, the Speaker of the House. No, it was to Henry Kissinger, because after all, we all know that Henry Kissinger was really the guy that was in charge there. And they needed somebody that they could trust. I guess they uh, got Carter and Brzezinski after that. Now, what would happen if we realized that our government was doing many of the things that they're doing? Now, of course, they don't want us to see that. They want to keep this report, and that's on the Senate committee's desk right now. They want to keep it secret. They want to keep it safe, 
And so they're pulling out all the stops. We see from Yahoo, from Michael Isakoff today, he's saying that there's a warning that's been issued by the CIA about releasing this torture report. It could get some people very upset, he said. An internal U.S. intelligence memo warns that the release of a Senate report on CIA interrogation techniques could inflame anti-U.S. passions in the Middle East. Well, actually, just like we were told about the Ed Snowden tapes, it's not any news to the people in the Middle East as to what Americans are doing. It's called blowback. They already know. The people who don't know are the American public. It's the American public that needs to understand what's really being done in their name. He had this to say. He said, you're handing the other side a recruitment tool. This is a former CIA deputy, John McLaughlin. He said, it's blindingly obvious. Well, it's blindingly obvious that the government is hiding things, and it's blindingly obvious to everybody except the American people. Take a look at the kind of propaganda and mind games that were being fed, for example, on social media. We know that it's had a tremendous sea change effect in the situation in Gaza. All the publications of all the children that have been killed there, many times a picture of a beautiful child uh, in a play, then with a caption that she was killed the next day. We don't have any way to verify that type of thing, but it's had a major effect on public opinion. Take a look at this article from Global Research. Kiev's fake picture scam. Now, look at some of the pictures. The first one he talks about is the one, the notorious Russian soldier image, which the Kiev government proudly presented to John Kerry as the long-sought evidence of Russian military involvement in the Ukraine. But then they realized that it was actually a picture stolen from an Instagram account of a photographer where it had clearly in the past been labeled as coming from a completely different area. Then take a look at this next picture of this uh, lady with a bloody hand extended, and they say that this is a woman who was killed fighting a, with the fighting in Ukraine, and yet this was someone who was protesting bullfighting. I don't know that she was even dead. This was a protest of bullfights. Then look at the next one. You've got a guy uh, down on the ground, and that's purportedly in Ukraine, and yet that was something that happened in Bosnia. But then he really gets to the key point here. Take a look at this little picture of this boy. He says, why would anyone bother to fake this picture? Of course, this is just a child that was playing in Russia, but they make him look like he's a victim of war. They say, why would they fake that? when they could share the story of a five-year-old who died with more than 309 shrapnel wounds in his head, or show the funeral of a 10-month-old who actually died. His point is, is that the public is now becoming so cynical that they won't accept the real pictures. Further down in the article, let's go to this next picture here where you see this uh, man holding a young child. He said, the public is now so used to fake pictures that they ignore the real ones, except to question their authenticity. So he said he recently posted this picture, which was real, and immediately got back the cynical response, this picture is not in Ukraine, and yet it was. It was a six-year-old child dying in her father's arms. They want you to disengage. They want you to shut down from cynicism and from overload. That's the technique. But there's a lot of different ways that they can fight this mind war, this propaganda game. Take a look at Lindsey Graham. This is another face of the propaganda war. This is a guy who on the surface is kind of Gomer Pyle and Goober, but underneath he's pure Machiavelli. He says he's predicting an American city in flames if Obama doesn't go to war in Iraq. This is from rawstory.com. This is what he said. He said, I think of an American city in flames because of terrorist ability to operate in Syria and Iraq. And he says, Mr. President, you've never once spoken directly to the American people about the threat we face from being attacked from Syria and now from Iraq. What is your strategy to stop these people from attacking the homeland? It's all about the homeland, isn't it? I'm saying that Iraq and Syria combined represent a direct threat to our homeland. His responsibility as president is to defend this nation. If he doesn't go on the offensive against ISIS, and ISIL, whatever you want to call these guys, they're coming here. It's about our homeland. See, he keeps repeating that propaganda, our homeland, to try to build this up for Department of Homeland Security. This is the same Lindsey Graham who, as we reported, when there were nuclear missiles that were coming out of Dias Air Force Base that were not even supposed to be in that Air Force Base, and we were told that they were going to South Carolina that same day, he was warning people that there might be a nuclear attack in South Carolina. If there is, ask where Lindsey Graham was on that day. 
Another way to put this out, of course, is to play to people's sympathies about being humanitarian as a variation of protecting the children. This article from the Ron Paul Institute points out the irony. It says, U.S. sends humanitarian bombs to Iraq as it warns Russia against humanitarian aid to Ukraine. He says, and this is Daniel McAdams, the U.S. administration began bombing Iraq today with hopes that the disaster created by the 2003 Iraq War II could be rectified by starting Iraq War III. The pretext was to rescue a religious minority trapped by the Islamic State of Iraq and Syrian ISIS fighters, and it was called humanitarian intervention. Meanwhile, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Samantha Powers, warned Russia as U.S. humanitarian bombs were falling on Iraq, that any further intervention in Ukraine, including under the pretense of delivering humanitarian aid, would be viewed as an invasion of Ukraine. She said with a straight face, he says, the humanitarian situation needs addressing, but not by those who have caused it. Of course, it's called an invasion if Russia arms a faction, but if we arm people, it's always humanitarian. It's always on the side of good. Joe Biggs is going to take a look now at what might be behind the arming of the Kurdish people. Thank you, David. And as we all know, the U.S. has been backing ISIS. We trained them, and now they're on their journey to take over Iraq. They've been slaughtering thousands and thousands of people. But now the U.S. government is going to back the Kurds, the only people in northern Iraq who actually have a chance at fighting ISIS, but... The ISIS fighters have been beheading and cutting people, and now the Kurdish military is a bit fickle. They're starting to run. But we're going to give the Kurds weapons, and I think it's for a reason. I don't think it's to help the Kurds fight ISIS. I believe it's a strategic idea, a strategic way to get to complete a cycle, so to say. We give the weapons to the Kurds. The ISIS fighters stay in northern Iraq, defeat the Kurds, take the weapons, and now they have re-upped their supply of ammunition and weapons, and they're ready to move south to take on Baghdad, their main objective throughout this entire mission. And many more people will die from this. As you can see, over the past few days, the U.S. has been bombing ISIS so far with different campaigns, three now, and the videos have been pretty shady, a bit fuzzy. It's almost like we're looking for Sasquatch in the middle of the night. It's just another facade. It's another beard that seems like we're helping defeat the monster we've created. Back to you, David. We need to always question what we're being told, question that narrative. Now, Alex Jones is gonna have a special report at the end of the news as school starts again. What kind of brainwashing are we gonna see from the mainstream media? We know what we're seeing from the mainstream media towards Christians. Can Christians have the discernment to understand what's behind the tragedies that we're seeing unfolding in Syria and in Iraq? The article up on Infowars.com today, Christian brothers and sisters, did you know our government is supporting Islamic terrorists? And of course, there's real terrorism going on. As Washington's blog points out, people are literally being crucified for being Christians in Iraq as well as in Syria. He said they're not only beheading Christians, they're systematically beheading Christian children. In Syria, rebels fighting against the Syrian government told Christians either you convert to Islam or you'll be beheaded. Syrian rebels slit the throat of a Christian man who refused to convert to Islam, taunting his fiancée by yelling, Jesus didn't come to save him. Yet we don't look at what's behind this. We just are told these stories to have a visceral reaction to strike out against someone. And many Christians don't have the discernment to understand where this is all coming from. This is a very important article that's up on Infowars.com. It's very lengthy. We don't have time to go into even most of the quotes from it. We've told you many of these things over and over again. It's always good to have this back in a compendium. He's got sources from ABC News, from World Net Daily, from Der Spiegel, the, the Guardian, Jerusalem Post, Breitbart, The Independent, on and on, talking about how our government has created these rebels in Syria, allowing them, equipping them, training them, and then they go in and attack these people in Syria. Now they're going into Iraq doing the same thing. And yet, what do we see from the Obama administration and even from Hillary Clinton? They're pretending that never happened. Even though we've got the pictures of John McCain posing with the terrorists, even though we've got all of these reports that are in this article talking about how we